You're listening to Seminary Dropout, and I'm your host, Shane Blackshear. In cooperation with MissioAlliance.org, straight from my house in Austin, Texas to yours, interviews with leading Christian authors, leaders, and thinkers, because good theology should be for everyone. This is Seminary Dropout. Let's go. My guest, Dominique Gilliard, is the Director of Racial Righteousness and Reconciliation for the Love, Mercy, Do Justice Initiative of the Evangelical Covenant Church. An ordained minister, he previously served in pastoral ministry in Oakland, Chicago, and Atlanta. He serves on the board of directors for the Christian Community Develop Association and Evangelicals for Justice. Dominique, thanks for being on Seminary Dropout. Uh, Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on with you today. The new book is called Rethinking Incarceration, Advocating for Justice That Restores. You know, you mentioned in the beginning of the book that there have been similar books that come out before uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow and Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. And I wonder what made you want to follow up those books with, with one of your own about incarceration. Yeah, there were a couple things. First and foremost, uh, I wanted to center this conversation for the church. Um, both of those books, as, as amazing as they are, uh, didn't really center the conversation for the church, and they definitely didn't include any kind of theological reflection to help people understand biblically uh, how this conversation is inherently connected to our faith and our ability to faithfully follow Christ. Um, but the second one was that... Um, Both of those books really talk about mass incarceration essentially as a byproduct of the war on drugs. And I wanted to expand the dialogue because there are really five conduits that are flowing people into mass incarceration and not just the war on drugs. But in addition to the war on drugs, you have the school to prison pipeline, the deinstitutionalization of mental health facilities, um, the privatization of prisons, And then ultimately a parallel war to the war on drugs that is just yet to be coined as a war. And that's the war on immigration. You know, this is really, it is what the title says. It's a book about our incarceration system here in the United States, but it's impossible to talk about that without doing a deep dive into, into race because most of them, uh, most of our issues revolve around that. I'm sure that there are, uh, white people who have gotten caught up in uh, these kind of flawed and unjust systems, but by and large, it's people of color, and it seems as though the system was designed that way to catch up more people of color in the system. Yeah, I mean, without a question, you cannot have authentic conversation about incarceration in our nation without talking about race. Um, It's predicted that today one in three black men will spend time behind bars in their lifetime. The number is one in six for Hispanic men. And the number goes, jumps all the way up to one in 17 for white men. Um, But you see the same discrepancy along uh, for females as well. Uh, One in 18 black women will spend time behind bars. One in 45 Latino women. And then it's one in 111 white women. So across the board, you see how race profoundly informs who's being incarcerated. So real quick, I wonder if we can just bring this all the way back, because it really starts at slavery and then, you know, immediately after. Um, for I think for those who pay attention, this is uh, well-trod ground. Uh, the documentary on Netflix 13th really explains how this works really well, um, but Essentially, you know, after after slavery, there was very quickly a new system developed to uh, keep keep black men and women uh, oppressed and from rising in society. Yeah. So right after slavery is abolished, you have a 12 year period of black empowerment known as the Reconstruction Era, where federal troops are sent down throughout the South to ensure that black progress isn't impeded. But as soon as the federal troops are withdrawn, you literally have this mad dash to re-articulate white supremacy throughout the land. And that happens really in 
three ways. You have the evolution of the system of sharecropping, which is essentially debt peonage, where you start to have Black people who are indebted to and therefore cannot move on from uh, the, the reality of slavery. Then you have the conglomeration of these restrictive laws that came known as Black codes. The Black codes were literally laws that were taken from slave codes and reinterpreted in a way that they could be reapplied after slavery was abolished. And then you have really the evolution of the Klan and the terroristic practice of lynching. But the Black codes in particular are important for this conversation around mass incarceration because the Black codes are laws that across the South uh, were state legislators of every state passed laws which began to effectively criminalize Black life and to create a situation in which African-American men found it almost impossible not to be in violation of some uh, the law in some way, shape, or form. And so these laws were applied all throughout the South. And I want to give you an example of one of the laws. So in South Carolina, they had an apprenticeship law for Black children. And this law said that a Black child that was born to an unfit parent and that's abstract, there's no definition of what that means. But a black child who was born to an unfit parent will be legally endowed to their former slave owner, men until they were 21 years of age and females until they were 18 years of age. And so you literally see um, black people being criminalized in a way that ultimately allows uh, for the exploitation of the loophole that exists in the 13th Amendment, which says that slavery is abolished in our nation except as a punishment for a crime. And so because you see Black people being criminalized in all of these ways, another example of the vagrancy, I mean, another example of the Black codes would be something known as the vagrancy law, which said that if a Black person could not prove that they were employed, then they could be incarcerated. And so you start to see this mass number of Black people being incarcerated, and then you see them being uh, leased out through a system known as convict leasing to corporations and former uh, slave owners. So they're back on the plant same plantations that they were on months before as slaves doing the exact same labor for the exact same people who are exploiting them um, under the same kind of exploitative circumstances. And convict leasing was this massive industry to, that blatantly just keeps the Southern economy afloat after slavery is abolished. So in Alabama alone, we know that at least 200,000 Black men were leased as convicts. And in 1989, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1898, convict leasing supplies 73% of the state of Alabama, Alabama's annual revenue, 73% of it. You told a story about one individual, and I cannot remember his name, but was caught up in the vagrant laws, essentially incarcerated for not having a job. And for, I think, I don't know, 30 days, something like that, was sentenced to labor. And then at the end of that, he wasn't able to pay his fine, of course, because he didn't have a job. And so he was sentenced to a year after that, and they were they put him in the I think in the coal mines, yep. And where he was locked up at night, the conditions just seemed awful, awful. There were tuberculosis, uh, other diseases that thrived, and most of these people died really, really early. And this particular uh, man died, I think you said at twenty two. Yep. Yeah. It's a tragic story. It's a, it's a story that was all too common um, in the era, particularly with convict leasing, where you saw his, uh, circumstances where historians actually say that convict leasing was actually worse than slavery. Uh, because during slavery, the slave owner would actually have a vested interest in keeping their slave alive because their slave was their property, and they could only make revenue from their property if their property was alive and was healthy enough to do labor. But under convict leasing, no one actually owned the slaves. They were just leased and rented. And so you literally saw Black people being worked to death. And then once they died, they would just take the same money that they paid to lease you to lease the next person. And so it was actually... Uh, 
platform where you could be exploited for your labor until death, literally. W.E. Du Bois even talks about this way back in 1903 in his classic book, The Souls of Black Folk. He wrote, the black folks say that only colored boys are sent to jail and not because they are guilty, but because the state needs criminals to eke out its income by their forced labor. And states were making a lot of money on convict leasing. Filthy rich. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, I think that Nixon is in his campaign is the first one to use the, the phrase law and order. And that really reverberates even to today. It, it seems like from what I've gathered from the from news and from reading, um, for a long time, so Nixon campaigned on this platform of law and order. So meaning we're gonna we're gonna lock up criminals, the streets are gonna be safer. And it seems like basically until now, it is political kryptonite to for a politician to be labeled soft on crime. And so I get the feeling that this really rose to a fever pitch in the maybe late 80s and 90s where you see politicians who are, are running against each other in elections kind of trying to outdo each other on, on being hard on crime, uh, on strict on crime. And, and, they're really just um, trying to prove that they are they're the ones that are going to be most hard on crime. And so we see things like the mandatory minimums. We see things like stricter punishments for drugs that are more prevalent in black communities than white. Yeah, so I think the the primary example was, you know, the presidential campaign in 1988. Uh, where you saw uh, Dukakis and the the infamous Willie Horton, um, and you saw this caricature of uh, a black male who should be feared, who was going to come and rape and kill and pillage your communities, and so he was became the poster child, um, and then ultimately uh, he becomes somebody who we automatically associate with black criminality and the, the kind of rhetoric we continue to even to hear into the present day um, where we hear officers talk about, you know, shooting and killing unarmed um, black men because they fear for their lives, because they look like monsters, because they, you know, they had this fear. And so I think when we talk about this, we have to trace the lineage of it. But I think the real way where you see some of this crossover is through the presidential campaign of Clinton, where Clinton was really the first Democrat who said, we are continuously losing out on elections because we are seen as too sympathetic or too soft on crime. And so he, because of that, starts to advocate for really rigorous crime uh, legislation, like three strikes you're out, um, and which ultimately evolves into our school systems as zero tolerance policies and um, things that really expedite what was known and has kind of expanded and more even in more sinister ways into the school to prison pipeline. And so example of this would be, um, like you said, the disproportionate sentencing that we see between crack and powder cocaine. So historically, a person would get a hundred times more severe sentencing for having crack cocaine than powder cocaine uh, for the exact same amount, even though the substance has the exact same uh, impact on a person, uh, the person with crack would get a hundred times more severe sentencing. So in 2010, they said that they were actually addressing that through the Fair Sentencing Act, and they actually were going to make it more equitable. And so instead of 100 to 1, now you get 15 to 1, um, even though the only true equivalency would be a 1 to 1 sentencing. But disproportionately, Black and brown people use crack and white people use powder. But that's so strange to me. It seems like in 2010, they're kind of acknowledging that there was uh, an injustice there, and yet they still 
they still make it way disproportionate, not 100 to 1, but like you said, 15 to 1. I was thinking 18 to 1, but yeah, 15 to 1. Um, did they, did they, was there a given reason for not just making it one to one? Did they, I, I think originally the excuse they gave was they thought that crack cocaine was somehow more, more dangerous. Yeah. I think the excuse that they gave was really more connected to the media propaganda and some of the rhetoric and the commercials and the characterization of how, um, crack was turning people violent. more violent. Yeah. Um, but reality, uh, medical professionals have talked about it literally has the same impact on the body. So it was really using the propaganda and the fear mongering that's out there to legitimate the disproportionate sentencing. But in medically, there is no difference. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I did. I, I misspoke. You were correct. It is 18 to 1. Not oh, okay. To 1. Yeah. Sorry. You were, you're correct. I too many numbers floating in my head. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. There's a lot of there, especially when you talk about, about this, there are a lot of numbers floating around. Um, the mandatory minimums, that seems to be like a huge piece of our broken justice system. One that for, for single crimes, people are, are sent away for far too long. And then the kind of three strikes you're out rule. I mean, people could, I think this was enacted in the Clinton administration, uh, three, three drug offenses, and they lock you up for life. So, and I don't know, is that even still, is the three strikes you're out, is that still in play? Yeah, one of the strikes has to be a felony uh, sent, sentencing, but after that, any misdemeanors, any three strikes, and you're out. Um, and so this this legislation really started to pass between 1993 and 95, and 25 states ultimately ended, ended up enacting three strikes, you're out legislation. Uh, Georgia, even in 1920, 1995, took it to the next step, and they enacted a two strike, and you're out sentencing, um, just to really amplify like what you're talking about. Um, this this punitive nature of responding to crime so that you're not seen as being soft on crime. I can totally imagine two Georgian politicians and one saying three strikes you're out and another one saying, well, if I'm elected, it'll be two strikes you're out. I don't know if that literally happened, but you can, I can imagine that that was the kind of the way that it would have escalated back then. And now, yeah, and you know, Georgia's my home state. I'm originally from right outside of Atlanta, and that's very much how it went down. Um, and so you have that, and like you said, mandatory minimums are this critical piece of legislation that literally strips uh, the judge of its their judges of their ability to look at the context of where how a crime played out, and so. Judges literally have no choice if certain things are met, uh, like if a crime occurs in a certain uh, zoned district or if someone has a certain amount of possession of drugs, whether it's meant for their own personal use or distribution, a judge has no autonomy to, de to determine or differentiate sentencing. There are mandatory requirements, and if those mandatory requirements are met, the judge must legally enact a certain sentence. And for the first time, I think you're seeing judges really grapple with this, um, where there have been a couple of federal judges who've come out and said, if mandatory sentences are not taken away, I don't know if I can continue to do this job mm. because the sentences that I'm passing down are so unjust. And we are locking people up who don't need to be locked up. They need medical interventions and they need alternatives to incarceration. But literally, my hands are tied legally. So um, I think we're starting to see the tide turn in some of these regards. But it's hard because there are all of these um, kind of ebbs and flows with how legislation is going in regards to who's in charge, particularly within presidential administration. So another example of this would be um, the use of private prisons. So under the past administration, there was a declaration that we were going to phase out the federal use of private prisons with the hope that ultimately states would follow suit. Uh, 
But then when the new administration came in, they actually reaffirmed our commitment to private prisons mm -hmm. and the legislation uh, that's been passed down has actually expedited um, mm -hmm. the use of private prisons. Now, with that said, though, I think it's fundamentally important for people to know that I bluntly say that this is a bipartisan agenda. Both parties are implicated in uh, mass incarceration and its evolution. Both parties have used get tough on crime, law and order rhetoric to politically expedite um, members of their party's uh, political careers. And so there are fundamental ways in which both parties have really um, exacerbated the problem. And as an example, since I just highlighted uh, our present administration in 2010, it's important to know that there was a Democrat by the name of Robert Byrd who introduced the immigration bed mandate that says that on average, ICE must uh, detain around 34,000 people nightly for immigration offenses. Mm. And so you see there is a definitely a Republican and Democrat participation in this. And then one last legislation I just want to highlight as being critically important was that in 1997, when there was um, this decision that um, whatever drugs, money, or paraphernalia, or kind of cars or different things were seized at the point of an arrest, the officer could now pocket that. Um, that really incentivized officers to really start to participate in the war on drugs at a new level because officers are oftentimes underpaid. Um, and in this regard, you're going to give them an incentive that anybody that they arrest who has drug money, cash on them, that that money is theirs at the point of seizure that ends up really incentivizing um, people to be more active participants in the war. Is that the taking of the, the cash and property, whatever, the, the officer personally can keep that or the department? The department, but, you know, it can get murky. Um, but the, the seizure of the actual cash and the cars and whatever is directly connected to a person who is being incarcerated in relation to the drug war, all of those assets ultimately go to the department. And so there is this direct incentive to be um, active within the drug war. I mean, that is just, to me, it seems so unjust and so corrupt. If you're, you're allowing law enforcement departments to, to profit from arresting people, and to fund to fund their department not through taxpayer money alone but through again possession from certain things um and which by the way I've heard that it's very hard if if something is seized and it later is found out that that it shouldn't have been maybe there wasn't a legal activity there was legitimate reason that somebody had an amount of cash with them it's very difficult to get that back at, uh, exactly. after, it's, after it's already happened. Exactly. And so that kind of legislation has led to like blatant injustices. I know like one of the ones that I highlight is the story from Tulia, Texas that happened in 1999, where uh, SWAT officers came into the Black community, the Black impoverished community in this small rural town and they arrested 47 people. And out of the 47, um, it ended up being that that number constituted 30% of the town's Black males and 20% of the town's uh, Black adults in general. And ultimately, um, all of this was driven by a former co a cop who was an undercover cop who himself <laughs> had uh, a warrant out for his own criminal activity. And it turned out that he had lied and fabricated data, and he was literally arresting all of these people on charges that were just over the amount to make them a felony. And then they were taking them to court and through pressure, uh, coercing people to actually uh, take plea bargains that would allow them to be able to get $2,000 per, per plea bargain. Um, 
that was agreed to. And there were people who ended up spending years in prison um, because they were afraid to go to trial because in some cases they were charging them to 90 years to life for first time drug offenses. And it was only because one of the people that he lied about had a bank receipt showing that on the day that he said that the drug transaction went down, that she was in another, a completely different state at the exact time that he said that the transaction went down. And she by chance happened to keep a big statement that proved her legitimacy and ultimately helped unravel the whole case uh, where they saw that almost everybody who was arrested was wrongfully arrested. So that case highlights another huge flaw in the system, which is often if someone who, you know, especially is, is in a under underserved class, if someone's in poverty and they're arrested for something, um, even especially, I mean, it's especially unjust when they didn't do the crime, when they know that they're innocent, they often take the plea deal and you know maybe be fined a lot or go go to jail or go to prison um rather than going to trial because um they're not going to be represented by the best attorney because it's going to be a court appointed attorney um and i know in that case that you were just talking about many of those people took the plea deal which you know means they're just accepting punishment. They're not going to court to try to prove that they're innocent, knowing that they were innocent the entire time. Exactly. It's a it's a fear mongering tactic um, because the harsh reality is that legal professionals say that if we completely took away plea bargains and everybody took their case to trial then the system would literally break down because we don't even have enough people to take all of these cases to trial. Hmm. But if you're poor and you know that you don't have the resources, and particularly if you're a person of color, you don't feel that the legal system is going to give you a fair shot. What you're going to do is say, even though I didn't do it, I'm going to be willing to take this plea bargain because within this plea bargain, at least I know that I'm going to get out within three years or maybe immediately. Um, and so a primary example of how this can play out is the story of Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder um, was the juvenile in New York who had been accused of stealing a book bag and they offered him a plea bargain and they told him that if he agreed to the plea bargain, he could just go home and pay a fine. Khalif said, I'm not going to, take this plea bargain because I know I didn't do it. And ultimately, he ended up spending three years behind bars. and He was never found guilty of a crime. But in spite of that, he spent three years behind bars. And because of the trauma, the abuse, and the dehumanization that he experienced behind bars, he ultimately ends up committing suicide shortly after being released. But we live in a society where somebody like Khalif to literally spend three years behind bars and never be found guilty of a crime. Um, and so it, it, it brings very tangibly to play what you're talking about with uh, how people are being coerced. And if you resist that coercion, you still can be incarcerated without even being convicted of a crime. And he was, he was held because he couldn't pay the bail. Um, and so in a lot of respects, there's a lot of activists who talk about us going back to a system of debt peonage where we're incarcerating people just because they're too poor to pay the bail, yeah. um, mm -hmm. even though we haven't actually convicted them of a crime. The first part of the book where you talk about all these things that we've been talking about, peppered throughout that are scripture and talk about Jesus. And then the entire second half of the book, part two, is about the church's witness and testimony. And I appreciated that so much. So I have another podcast where uh, that's all about uh, race through the lens of Christianity. And often the, the biggest pushback we get on that podcast is that it's not Jesus-y enough. <laughs> there's, there's not enough Bible study in it. And while, yeah. while I appreciate, I appreciate that inclination 
part of me says, really, you need a specific verse to know that racism is bad. Um, mm. uh, I mean, just uh, just being vaguely aware of who Jesus is should be enough motivation biblically to push back against systemic racism and injustice. But I really appreciated that you spent so much time with that. And I wonder if you could talk about uh, just the, the history of the church as it relates to incarceration, the, the prophetic activism um, and chaplaincy and all those ways that, that the church has been involved, good and bad, in the past. Yeah, I think this was, again, the part of the book that really distinguishes itself from some of the other books that are out there. Um, I wanted to tell how the church has related to our criminal justice system. And I wanted to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's just really what the history is. It's good, it's bad, and it's really ugly at times. And so... I wanted to talk about how within the first penitentiary that is actually built in our nation, uh, there were Christians who were very much uh, involved in the process, trying to formulate prisons as a place uh, at that time known as penitentiaries, where people could actually focus on penance and actually realize uh, the depth of their sin and ultimately have time to contemplate, um, repent, and actually do the hard work of reformation to re-enter society as productive, healthy citizens. Um, and one of the early stories I talk about is particularly the Quakers were probably the most prophetic voice in this conversation. And you had a Quaker who was arguing with political leaders that uh, correctional officers inside the prisons should not be allowed to carry weapons uh, because as a Quaker, that actually contradicted with what their belief was that it meant to follow Jesus, um, who was nonviolent in orientation. And so you see the church really playing a critical role, even from the beginning, to try to make uh, prisons a more humane place. Um, I think my favorite activist in this respect was Elizabeth Fry, who uses her social capita to really transform prisons into a more humane, dignifying place. So if she uh, uses her social capita and she gets political um, political uh, leaders to come and actually spend the night in prison to actually get proximate to the suffering and the in, uh, inhumane circumstances that people are being locked up and confined within. And then she tells them to go back and use their platform to bear witness to the need for prison reform. And so it's it's so beautiful in the way that she uses and leverages her social capital for justice and the furtherance of the kingdom in creating a space where people truly are dignified in the midst of being held accountable for their offenses. Um, I think you also uh, you also have a uh, chaplain, the legacy of chaplains, which you know is probably the most varied um, of all of the testimonies and witness. So you have uh, certain chaplains who commit themselves to making prisons a more humane place, and they theologically um, advocate for the church to step up in its role and actually be. Uh, protectors of the sanctity of life, even the life of those who have committed heinous crimes. And so I talk about a chaplain uh, by the name of Dwight who really does this. And he he goes behind bars. And when he first goes, he's just so in shock and awe of what he finds there that he goes on this national campaign and he starts writing letters to churches all across the country saying, where is the voice of the church? Where is the witness of the church and stepping up and actually advocating to make sure that people's humanity is not being threatened behind bars? Um, and so he bears witness to um, the restorative nature of uh, God's justice. But then you have other chaplains who come along later on and they actually start to understand the prison as what the term that's used is a furnace of affliction. 
And so they actually talk about prisons as the place where um, sinful beings must be brought to their knees in an understanding of their depravity and is ultimately through physical punishment and um, really dehumanization that they understand the depth of their depravity. And at that point, that's when they truly are in a space to give their life to Christ and to actually understand their need for a savior. And so they clamp, they call out and they cry out because they understand the depth of their depravity, but it's only through suffering, which they have uh, inflicted upon other people, it is only through them enduring suffering that they can come into a full understanding of that. And so there's really a distortion of theology and scripture, and there are some really critical verses that are used to legitimate blatant brutality where you see, I tell some stories of people being whipped with uh, uh, bats and um, cattle crates and it's just, and literally being given dog food instead of the food that they should be getting um, because people think that that kind of uh, punishment, corporal punishment, will really actually bring about a deeper, truer repentance. And so there's, there's this one story where a man is flogged 133 times with something called the cat, which is a bat that literally just has spikes uh, poking out throughout it. And um, as the agents are whipping him, uh, they say that they want him to cry and writhe under the laceration and that the laceration tear his skin back and is literally peeling off his back with each lash that he takes. And so there is this way in which the church um, really kind of baptizes punishment and says that it's essential for people who have actually gone astray to coming to a full understanding of their need for Jesus and the Savior. And so there is this real mixed bag of the church's witness um, behind bars, um, and I, I just wanted to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly, but then I move on, and tell me if I'm going too fast here, but I move on to kind of talk about how the stories and the narratives that these chaplains tell and report back to congregations fundamentally start to shape our mind uh, around who is incarcerated and what these people are like in a way that I think has really dissuaded us from living into passages like Matthew 25 that blatantly say that all Christians, not progressive Christians, not literal Christians, uh, liberal Christians, but all Christians who are followers of Jesus are supposed to be present behind bars. Um, and so if we start to think of criminals, quote unquote, um, incarcerated people is actually a terminology I like to use, but uh, well, if we actually start to think of them as so sinister, as so deviant, as so irredeemable, which some of the chaplains ultimately end up saying that incarcerated people are irredeemable, then I think it starts to dissuade the body of Christ from living into Matthew 25, because why would you go and visit prisoners and safely be present behind bars if these people are ultimately irredeemable? And so it's that witness from chaplains, I think, in a way that has dissuaded us from taking that passage seriously, or even a passage like Hebrews 13, 3, that says we're supposed to remember the incarcerated as if we ourselves were incarcerated. And so I just wanted to kind of put it all out there, but then turn us back to the biblical text and ask us to take seriously the text consistent, uh, explicit call to be present behind bars and to actually be advocates in light of an unjust criminal it seems like the church has really been been on the wrong side every step of the way. I mean, obviously, I say the church, really the white church, obviously in slavery and seemed to be at least quiet about convict leasing. And then even to modern day, the evangelical church was, was just echoing the calls for uh, law and order and really ushering in and supporting these politicians that were calling for such punitive measures against uh, people in the criminal justice system. And it, it was interesting because I felt like before the election of Donald Trump, uh, 
there the tide seemed to be turning on in people realizing that our prisons were too full that we were incarcerating too many people and there seemed to be bipartisan support to do something different um, I think even people that weren't concerned about the social justice side of it were really seeing just the economic cost of incarcerating so many people and uh, and the direct cost and then also the indirect cost of, of uh, you know, men who, who weren't able to go to work, women who weren't able to go to work and support their families. And, and it seems like this is a very pivotal moment where the church has an has a an opportunity to be a prophetic voice in the culture right now for sure and i think with the economic cost i i intentionally do not spend a ton of time talking about that because i think it leads some people to care about this issue for the wrong reason yeah i agree we are supposed to care about this issue because these are human beings who are having the image of god be faced from them because the economics is important because the system is fiscally irresponsible too. Yeah. And so, for example, in 1971, we spent about $12 billion on incarceration. In 2012, we were spending $81 billion. It's a $69 billion increase from 1971 to 2012. And this problem is so bad that California, which leads the nation in cost uh, per prisoner in regards to how much it cost to incarcerate someone. Last year, it was found that it costs more to incarcerate a person in the state of California than it does to pay a year worth of tuition at Harvard. And so it's fiscally irresponsible too. But this is where I believe that Christians should not be surprised by this reality um, because mass incarceration is a byproduct of the love of money. And scripture tells us that the love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. And that is really what our system is. It is devolved into an evil system that is predicated upon dehumanization, isolation, and financial exploitation. Um, prison uh, people who are locked up behind bars are being exploited for their labor and they're doing anything from producing um, license plates to police uniforms to uh, furniture that's used within dormitories. Um, also, like in state in California, for example, every year where there's wildfires that are happening, incarcerated people are actually taken out of incarceration and forced to fight wildfires because a, a person who is incarcerated gets about $3 a day on average for their labor for a full day's work or work. To pay somebody what it costs to actually fight those wildfires, a trained professional, it will cost $26 an hour to pay them. And so you're making huge benefits. And at the end of the day, you can do it because you believe that if something happens to this person, ultimately, ultimately no one will care. And so there is this way in which um, incarceration has become a huge business, not even to mention the fact that private prisons are now one of the most bought and sold stock on Wall Street. Um, and there was an executive for CBS Money Watch when the new administration came into play who said, without question, private prisons will be one of the most lucrative and secure investments that someone can make over Wall on Wall Street over the next four years. And so there's this way in which there is this real love for money that is directly connected to this conversation of mass incarceration. Let me say one more thing real quick about a connection between scripture and incarceration. I think, I think we have failed to really reckon with the fact that four of the books of our Bible were written in the midst of incarceration. Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians were all written in the midst of incarceration. Those are called the Pauline prison epistles. Um, but then on top of that, the reality is if you take all incarcerated people out of the, the Bible, there is no gospel. Like literally, there is no gospel. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, John the Baptist, Samson, Hananiah the seer, Joseph, Malachi, Stephen, Jeremiah, Peter, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Silas, all criminals. If you were to take them away, there is literally no Bible. And that's not even to mention other people in scripture who committed criminal offenses who just didn't serve any time. 
i.e. David and Moses, who both murdered people. And so there is this way in which the early church understood that God could speak through people who were incarcerated and God desired to speak for and God had a plan for people after they'd been incarcerated. But there's something that we are missing today from the church as the church that we don't believe that God still has that desire. Um, we actually subtly but surely, if we're honest in our heart of hearts, know that a lot of times we think of incarcerated people as irredeemable, as people who are too far away from the love of God, that God cannot and definitely does not desire to use and speak through them. But one of the things that I was most excited to highlight in the book is the expansion and the explosion of the gospel behind bars. And this was one of the things that took me off guard. I did not realize that there are so many disciples making disciples behind bars. There are people who are being trained up to serve as prison pastors, and it's becoming so robust that some of these people are actually being trained up to the point that they're being sent out as prison missionaries to other prisons that don't have a church and a witness of Jesus Christ behind bars. And they're being sent as missionaries to actually go as people who are confined and locked up, who are still serving time, to go and disciple other people to actually bring more people into the kingdom of God. And so I think it was really sobering for me because growing up, I know I wasn't taught that we had brothers and sisters behind bars. I was just taught to think of people who are locked up as deviant people who I should keep a safe distance from. But I think scripture slow, uh, consistently calls us into a proximity with the incarcerated in part so we can understand that when we go behind bars, we don't go to bring Jesus we actually go to be present with our brothers and sisters. And oftentimes when we go, our brothers and sisters end up ministering more to us than we minister to them. And so I think that's just one critical thing I wanted to make sure that I included because that was probably one of the most joyous parts of our research for this book. I always think it's very interesting to look at the the kind of meta narrative of scripture. And if you look at that concerning incarceration. Christians aren't the ones locking people up. They're the ones most often being locked up. Nothing irks me more than when people preach out of Romans 13 and and use that to <laughs> preach that we should be subject to our governing authorities and leave it at that and don't mention that the same guy basically writes like a fourth of the New Testament from prison, from jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not even to mention that, you know, when we talk about the church and its healthy expression, oftentimes we go to the book of Acts. But the book of Acts has more examples of Christians who live counterculturally and who are willing to prophetically bear their bear witness to their faith in such a way that is threatening to the Roman Empire that they ultimately end up getting incarcerated for how prophetic their faith is. And so when we talk about the church being healthy, one could actually reasonably deduce that there is a correlation between Christians being willing to, willing to prophetically live their faith out in such a way that it causes them to be incarcerated and the church growing. Mm. But we don't like to talk about that. <laughs> because I think we just lost that, kind of, that nature of discipleship. Like, discipleship should never cause us to actually resist earthly authorities, even if we know the legislation is unjust. And so, you know, when the law said that it was legal for slavery to transpire, the gospel was calling people to resist that law. Um, when we knew, even today, when the law in certain states says that it's illegal for us to feed homeless people, but scripture consistently tells us to feed the hungry, that, to me, is a true line where we have to understand where our true citizenship lies. And ultimately, if the laws of this land call us to actually uh, disobey scriptural mandates, then we must remember who we are and whose we are. Mm. And as we realize where our true citizenship lies, then we can discern what faithful response to the gospel looks like, even in the midst of uh, 
law, I mean, even in the midst of Romans 13. And so I, I have a whole section in the book that wrestles with that question. But I think it's a critical question that really has hindered the church and witness in the world. Dominique Gilliard, um, your voice is is so prophetic, and I'm so thankful that it's it's coming from the church. So thank you for all the work you did on this book, and thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Remember, you can find all the show notes for this show and all shows at shaneblackshear.com. Oh, and hey, have you ever thought about starting your very own podcast? I bet you have. And I think you should do it. In fact, I've created a course just for you to teach you everything that I've learned over the last couple of years producing Seminary Dropout. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to learn how, Go check out my course. You can go there by typing in podcastingforeveryone.org. And you can get a special discount by typing in the discount code Seminary Dropout, all one word. That'll give you 25% off. So go check it out. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thanks to those that left ratings and reviews on iTunes this week. Remember, that keeps the show front and center. Also, remember, you can find me on Twitter at at Beard on a Bike. That's at Beard on a Bike. Also, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com slash Shane Blackshear123. And remember that Seminary Dropout is listener supported. You can visit supportseminarydropout.com and press become a patron. Remember, this music you're listening to right now is by D.L. Rossi. You can find him online on iTunes and at dlrossi.com. All right. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Love you. Take care. But.